yeah, this is what I'm going to try to cover today. So what we do at the farm, the biodiversity and primary industry, they're really, really linked, as we've just realised in there. It's, um, it's a whole ecosystem of farm. It's not just your grassland and then, um, you know, that's really what you're focused on. For me, it's also trying to increase our biodiversity uh, in our non-farming primary industry areas as well. The benefits and difficulties that, that we found in um, implementing and running a planned rotational grazing system for the cattle and also implementing the, um, the, the mobile poultry. We'll go through some economics quickly of, uh, on, on some of the figures that I work with um, for future opportunities and questions as well. Thanks, mate. So yeah, so this is an aerial shot of the farm. It was bought by my grandparents in the 1960s. And when they cleared the paddock for cattle breeding, they had a lot of foresight in leaving some of the remnant vegetations along the drainage lines and the creek here too. So the property is kind of like this. So there's a significant amount of bush there, um, which backs onto the Tulangi State Forest. So they saw that there was a real need to, to provide a conduit for the, uh, the fauna traveling from the Tulangi State Forest to be able to move through the property in un uninterrupted canopy um, down to the, to the creek here and the road reserve that goes down to the Yay River. So there's a really good... Um, the farm, when it was cleared, there was some really good thinking about biodiversity even back then in the 1960s, which is a great legacy to continue on now. So they put some stock dams in through that central uh, wildlife corridor that's actually covenanted now. Um, they put some stock, sorry, some habitat dams in there because you really need water if you want to have life and biodiversity in a landscape. Yeah, so covenanted with Trust for Nature, so it's, it's on the title as for, for perpetuity. So um, it should be there to forever, hopefully. And um, we do have obligations to to um, maintain and enhance the biodiversity of, this, of these areas that are covenanted. And which, which was something that was really great is um, back in 2013, we did a little bit of monitoring with infrared cameras and found a couple of long-nosed bandicoots that had different length noses. So um, they're threatened, one of our threatened um, marsupials mainly because their habitat's gone, you know, the, the ecosystems no longer exist because they really need the shrubs and the low-lying rushes to hide from predators um, during the day so they can come out at night and forage. We also saw a lot of foxes in, these, um, in this monitoring with the infrared cameras. So there's plenty of foxes on our place, the same as anywhere else, uh, but these little critters still are surviving there, which is really great. And I think that's because there is that biodiversity around them which we, we've understood is, is um, creating resilience in the system. So these guys are still around. Uh, you know, the, the, the megafauna is great. You know, you can, you really, you love seeing these guys, the ring-tailed possums. This one's actually perching on one of the chicken caravans out in the paddock, which I thought was quite interesting. Uh, probably gone out there for a bit of a feed of the chook food, possibly. Uh, I deposited him back into the Covenant area when I'd, when I'd seen him out there. So um, the other thing that's, that is a really good indicator for us, I think, is that we're seeing migratory birds actually nest and have their, their young on the, on the property, which is, which is really great to see. I think that's a good indicator of health. So uh, we've got this great track of bush. Um, which has all the ecological services that I'm glad I don't have to explain to you guys because it's been done so well this morning. But what, what, could we, um, what enterprises could we actually put on top of, the, on top of that, um, the bush area there to get some kind of economic value out of it in terms of dollars? Well, a, a big one that I'm trying to develop is actually um, capturing some of the nectar that's in that area in the form of honey. It also helps with pollination of our veggie patch, which is great. Um, so trying to do this in a sustainable way though, you know, so there aren't too many bees and then they start taking the nectar from the honey eaters and the tree keepers and, and, and those um, parasitic wasps that actually utilise the nectar 
and then go out into your paddocks and, and uh, collect all the larvae from the cockchafers and things like that. So you need those guys and you've got to feed them. Also, there are some Murray Cod in our dam. We're lucky enough to have a cousin who was into native uh, fish breeding and these fish are amazing. I don't know how many of you guys are actually from the Murray area here, but Murray Cod are just the most incredible fish, really good to catch recreationally. Um, and I see the, uh, the wildlife corridors and these animals and the fauna as being a really good opportunity to um, have people come and have a look, you know, capture the tourism that's in our area as well. So on the primary industry side, we do have a self-replacing beef herd that we've now gone into a, what the, the farm was set stocked in those paddocks that you see cleared traditionally by my grandparents. Um, my mother then got really interested in uh, regenerative agriculture <coughs> about five years ago, invested a significant amount of money into fencing and um, watering points so that we could reduce our paddock size down to about two hectares. Um, since I've started coming onto the farm and helping a bit in the last few years, we then thought to ourselves, well, is the two hectares too big? Is there a way that we can make it more flexible so that it's not always just two hectares? And the way we do that is with electric fencing and that 24 hour cell so that we can really control the stock density in our paddocks and while maintaining the production on the cows by feeding them enough food to kind of fill their guts. Yeah, and then the other thing that happened was when I came back to the farm, we could see that there just wasn't enough money in the beef to, to keep me on the place. So um, I was lucky enough to have that experience with Joel Salatin to hear him speak and have this, it was a real light bulb moment for me. It was just that this, this is such a great idea. I like chooks, and so it really was a no-brainer to, to just get a, a few, you know, 30 chooks and just see what it was like, see if I could do it. And um, over the last three years, yeah, we've built up to around 900 layers, and that's where we'll probably stay um, for the time being. Okay, so how do we control the fox problem that we all have? Um, you can kind of see here, it's kind of fuzzy, but that's an elect it's called an electro net. It's an electric mesh um, that's a portable fence. And so it's got these uprights that are insulated with spikes on the, on the bottom so that you tread them into the ground like a temporary cattle fence. It certainly is, but you know, it's much more economically um, disastrous to have a fox come in and eat your chooks. This is 100% effective, this fence. Three years I've never lost a chook out here to a, to a fox. So I sleep really well at night, which is great. Yeah. Yeah, so there are spikes on the bottom of the uh, uprights that hold the netting up and you tread those into the ground. Yep. So how do you go with native cats? How do we go with native cats? Um, I haven't seen any large, you know, bush, feral bush cats. We certainly have neighbours that have cats and they're around the place. So the benefits to this idea of planned rotational grazing, so we're doing a 24 hour crash grazing of, of small cells and then having a, around a five months, five to six month rested recovery period behind the cattle. So 150 to 180 days where the plants are just being allowed to recover themselves from their root energy so that we don't come back too early and overgraze them and really become mature plants. So if you, you guys may be familiar with leaf stages, we want our, our, um, our grasses, our perennial grasses to get to you know, past the third to fourth to fifth to sixth leaf stages. So there are like three leaves there that are browned off. They're not actually green and, and highly palatable any, anymore. So what that does for us is there's, there's actually fibre in the pasture sward there because some of the, the leaves aren't green, but there's also that protein source in the green leaves. So you're trying to get a balance in the pasture, in the mature pasture sward. That will lead to a steady nutritional curve so because they're really mobbed up, they don't have a chance to walk around the entire paddock and pick out the really luscious, delicious grasses, which they will do if you have them in a set stocking situation. So um, they're getting a little bit of good stuff when they first get into that paddock. And then they're also eating the, the less palatable weedy type plants that probably have most of the nutrients in them anyway. So the complete utilization 
of the, uh, so just quickly, this is the daily plan that we use to <coughs> help us plan five to six months into the future. Um, where exactly, so down this column here are the paddocks and how many days we're actually going to be in the paddocks. That's the grey ones here you can see, so that's the plan I've done. And then tracking, how actually did we meet the plan? And we'll look at that at the end of the six months and say, right, we didn't quite get there, let's say, we maybe we're overstocked or something's going wrong because we're not getting to our goal, which is that five to six month rested rotation. This also allows us to think when we sit down and have a, a planning session, we actually think to ourselves, what's going to happen in the next six months? Are we going to carve? Are we going to wean? When are we, are we going to vaccinate? You know, um, when does the bull need to go in? If it's over summer, do we want to graze a paddock around the, around the house because we're worried about the... Um, you know, the really long grass and fire danger. So all of these things, just a simple tool like this, you start, um, it just helps so much to kind of uh, look at the world that you're in and see, you know, what are the risks and can I mitigate any of them? So we run a fence behind the cattle as well because we don't want them to walk back over the grazed area. Uh, say if you're in spring, and we're in, a, we're in one of those two hectare paddocks for, for say, you know, 16 days, so 16 cells. We don't want them, once they get to the end of the um, paddock, we don't want them to walk back over and eat the, the pasture that's just grown in the next 16 days. <coughs> that would be overgrazing where you're depleting the root energy and not allowing the plant to put that energy back into its root system and fully mature before the cows graze it again. So the question is, how do we manage the water supply? Yeah, cows need water every single day, especially their calving and things like that. So it's difficult, but we just, we, we run, say we've got a paddock that's a square, like this, the screen here. Mm -hmm. We'll have a water point in the centre. And there are many ways to do this, right? And a lot of people do plan to rotational grazing in different ways. The way we do it is we have a central trough. We'll quarter the paddock into acceptable kind of um, semi-permanent fence size. So say two hectares in our case. And then I'll run electric fences in wedges out from the water source. So it's like a wedge that leads into the water source every day. Yeah, yeah it takes about half an hour to set up the, the fence for the next day. So I'll do that um, a day in advance so that when I come out, I let the cows straight through. Otherwise, they'll be yelling at you, which I don't like. So thanks, Charlie. So yeah, you can see there's really complete utilisation of the pasture. You would have seen on the last photo. So, yeah, the, the, the reasons for doing it, all the things that we've heard this morning, we're, we're trying to promote a really diverse, highly perennial pasture that's going to persist, you know, for a very long time and be really resilient. Um, and planned rotational grazing can achieve the, the perennial diversity because you're allowing those perennial seedlings that come up each year to establish themselves and you're not going to then overgraze them either. So that long rested rotation is extremely important. It doesn't really, I mean, it, it does matter how hard you, you hammer the paddock while you're there, but it, much more important is how long it takes you to actually get back there. You want to get back there when you can see the plants that you want are fully mature. So it's a real shift for me because I was looking at um, the cape weed in the paddock and thinking, oh God, look at that cape weed there. I better get in there and, and you know, graze that with the cattle to, to knock it back. But if you can change your mindset to, I want to graze the plants that I want to have in the future, then it just shifts everything. And you stop focusing on the weeds and you'll, they'll just disappear. It's quite remarkable. <coughs> so yeah, we eliminate the overgrazing of the highly palatable stuff, which is what, we're, what um, traditionally we're all doing is we're knocking out that really good stuff that we want to have in our pastures so that we're we're moving to a less um, palatable uh, pasture and we then need to get in there and do some kind of corrective action. That's the, men the mentality. So we re-sow or we do something like that. The distribution of manure from the, manure from the stocks is, is amazing. It's like they all say, right, you go there and I'll go here. And it's just completely spread out across the, um, the cell really beautifully. <coughs> so we're, not, we're trying to eliminate the stock camps and get all the nutrient cycling of the manure into um, a much more even, balanced uh, situation in the soil.
stock density is critical, I reckon. We're trying to get up to around 5,000 DSCs per hectare, and that will allow us to trample quite a lot of that, uh, the brown, older, mature parts of the plant. And what that's going to do is feed the soil like we've been hearing in here. You, you can't just expect the, the microbes to be there. They're, they're, they're animals just like cows, so they've got to have something to eat. So really, what we're trying to do here is, is um, farm those as well. Um, but you've got to feed them by doing that. And this high stock density can do that. You'll actually trample <coughs> the residual onto the surface of the soil and it will start mulching um, when you get some moisture on it. The chooks do follow the, cow the cattle. Um, it's not like some people um, are trying to get their, ca their chooks to, to follow the cattle like four days behind and there's a good reason for doing that. Um, we'll jump on a bit, shall we? So the good reason for doing that is that the, cow, the chooks will actually spread cow pats for you if there's something in that cow pat that they want to eat. And um, three, to, three to four days after the cow's actually deposited it, you will have a blowfly larvae at pretty juicy size in there. So that's one of the reasons for trying to keep your chooks quite close to your, your cattle rotation so that they, they harrow the cow pats for you. It's just like an added bonus, I see it as, <coughs> when it does happen. But in order to, to make that happen, you know, your, your cattle rotation, so the size of the cells and the speed that you're moving around the farm, you have to match it with the chooks if they're, a, if they're an intensive system like ours is. So what I mean by an intensive system is um, the trailers are inside a protective fence that's portable. So that's, that's an intensive system in that, unlike this naughty chook here, <laughs> they're all meant to be in there. So they're, they're confined in there for their own protection, but allowing them to have um, access to grass and insects. So you can imagine if we have um, half a hectare, say, where the cows are, and we've only got quarter of a hectare where the chooks are, and the chooks are there for two days in that one spot, the chooks are moving a lot slower than the cattle. So over time, the cattle are going to get ahead. But we want to have... Um, we want the outside fence to work correctly, and the cattle do help with that. They, they mow the pasture in front of the chooks, and so we get a much better, uh, much <coughs> more secure fencing system around. And the chooks are really after, they don't want a blade of grass, you know, this long. They want that nice little green pick after the cows have passed. So people like Joel Salatin, who I, I, I enjoy listening to, he, he would say that it's optimal to have them three to four days after the cattle because they are going to spread the cow pats for you. We have introduced dung beetles, so they're, they're not foreign, and they, um, they're active late summer, spring, for quite a short window, actually. And will the chooks eat them? The chooks certainly will eat them. They'll love them. I don't mind that at all, actually, because, you know, dung beetles, they're insects. There are a lot of them. If they're there in a healthy population and there's no insecticides being sprayed, and, you know, you've got those, um, the bio biodiversity there, you know, they'll fly somewhere else and they'll get the cow pats, you know, next door. So I don't really see a situation in what we do where you're going to knock out all of your dung beetles. It's just not going to happen. So you can see um, one of the benefits, obviously, is the chook poo. It's extremely good fertiliser if you, you're putting it onto an actively growing pasture. So what happens is the chooks are pooing all the time. They never stop, basically. But at night time, they're all congregated into the trailer there. So your application rate is, is really far higher. I've worked out in two days it can be as high as like five tonnes per hectare if you're spreading a hectare. So it's a really high application under here. So you want to have a healthy um, soil biology uh, community so that th that uh, high nitrogen that you're applying isn't going to be lost. You know, the microbes are actually going to mop it up and then you're going to get that additional pasture growth there. So. I thought this was pretty amazing. I mean, you look next door, you can see we, on our farm we're certainly still lacking things and our farm isn't like, you know, a, a mecca for this kind of stuff. We're in the same journey that everyone is in. We're just trying to, um, we try to identify what the goals that we want to have and then how we're best going to do that while promoting the landscape function, our, our own personal lifestyle because we want to live in a beautiful place that we feel good about and also maintaining a profit. Yeah, so we, we tried a little bit of renovation on one paddock.
because we had uh, bent grass had just exploded since our set stocking and um, some of the practices we were doing was really prolific. So um, we double sprayed and did the annual uh, hay in between and then put a perennial after, did all that kind of stuff that we were being told to do um, without actually thinking it through ourselves and that paddock is just completely, I don't want to, it's, it's fracked, let's say. <laughs> so um, what we are seeing is there's definitely a, ch a shift back to the, the you know, the 40-year-old Victorian ryegrass that my grandfather put in there. So um, it's still persisting and we, we, we're seeing that there's plenty of seed there. It's just if you get the system right so that you're getting the germination of perennial plants that then are surviving through to the next season so they become healthy perennial plants that you don't overgraze, you really do start shifting. The seed's there. There's so much seed there, it's crazy. You know, it's, it's really, it's, it's there. So we've also seen coxfoot and other perennials um, come up as well in the place of the um, bent grass. So we reckon we're on a positive um, shift to, to becoming much more multi-species. We'd like to see like 30 different perennials in our pasture if we can. So um, yeah, this is the question exactly right here. So yes, they get feed a, fed a complete feed. It's a cereal mix. Uh, it doesn't have any meat protein in it. That was something that I was interested in because I didn't, quite see why we should be feeding our chicken, which is an omnivore, so they can eat meat protein, but they'd really try to eat insects if they could. They're not gonna try and eat, you know, scavenge for cows. So, um, yes, the grain's grown off farm, which is actually a really positive thing for our business, because it does drought-proof the farm to a certain degree. And we're also importing some nutrients in the, the, cow, the ch cow poo, chook poo, sorry, absolutely. Um, another benefit is getting into this, this part of the food production system. So producing something that people feel is ethical, they can see it, they, they can smell it, they can feel it, and they can say, yep, yeah, this, is, this is how we expect free range egg chook farming to be. This is it, you know. So that's, that's really great for how I feel about my, myself in, the, in, a, in terms of the society. Um, you know, it feels good to be a chicken farmer, which I, I'm surprised if there are many people, chicken farmers that can really say that um, in terms of the, uh, the community's view of, of ethics. So that, that feels great. It's also a real um, marketing point. So I'm getting uh, way more gross for my eggs than you could if you had them locked up in solitary confinement. So once, you know, the, the, the eggs really forced me to develop a direct marketing system. Because, you know, at 900 chooks sounds like quite a few, but it's not really in terms of how the market is set up. So, you know, the big players like supermarkets and places like that, they've got, they've, they're working with farms that are like 100,000, 200,000 um, chooks. So I really did have to look at this. Where could I see the best margin? You know, who is going to pay the most for my eggs? And um, what we have seen is that it's another benefit is that we have been able to, to find members of the public who really invested and interested in our farm, and we can then try to sell them beef and eggs and honey and other kind of products that we're trying to produce on the farm to become more uh, economically sustainable. Yeah, so when I direct sell the beef, um, it's probably about... 10% of our production at the moment. I'd like to see that increase, and we'll, we'll see why in the economics. We send our, or I take my, my animals down to an abattoir in Kyneton, and then they'll, they'll refrigerate a transport back to a butcher that I've selected, that I have a relationship with. He'll cut and pack it, and then I distribute it. So, you know, there's, I'd love to be able to have the, the beef being processed on the farm, um, by, I don't know, so maybe some kind of mobile abattoir. I think that'd be great. And actually, you know, um, dealing with the effluent there so that it doesn't become a massive problem when you have a huge factory that has, you know, tons and tons and tons and tons of effluent coming out the other end of it. So I think we should be trying to do more of that, but currently the regulations just do not allow for it. But you know, consumers have the power in the relationship here, I believe. So, you know, if people were demanding that, it'd happen. There's no doubt. Okay, cool. So, difficulties. Yeah, the, that initial expense, 
was, um, you know, you've got to find the money to do that if you want to set up a rotational grazing system, but I reckon you're going to be paid back in terms of stock health um, because you don't have that fluctuating nutritional curve. Um, water retention, all of, this, all of those biological services that are, are pretty hard to quantify, but I reckon they're really worth a lot of money. So the expense of putting the water and fencing infrastructure is difficult initially, but I think it's totally worth it. The um, cattle do quickly become tame. You would have heard me calling them through. And we've kind of had to adapt how we manage the stock. We used to push them around, you know, to try and get them to go where we wanted. These days, we're really just walking in front of them, trying to lead them through with their stomachs, but also just habit. Cattle can, uh, you know, they're extraordinary animals, really, the way they can learn. The, um, there is a daily, this daily commitment that I've got into, which is that 24-hour cell. Um, there's a lot of temporary fence set up, you might say. It's about three and a half hours a week, I'd say. Um, but I pay myself to do that work. So, you know, that's my job. Um, and it allows us to add value to our product because of, of, of the world view that we have. So if we can find consumers that have the same world view of us, and they are out there and they're definitely multiplying, um, we can definitely utilize um, you know, we can add value through the practices that we're doing. Uh, another difficult one is, and especially when you first start out, is this maintaining one large, large mob, because you want to get that, that rotation length. So you really need to bring it, everything together as much as you can. Um, that's difficult, obviously, with replacement heifers if you're joining and weaning. Uh, but it's, you know, these things are difficult, but they're certainly not impossible. And there's many, many ways for doing these things now. So difficulties with the chooks, yeah, they've got to be moved regularly. That high um, nutrient load from their poo is, you know, it's pretty full on. So you can do some damage with that stuff too. Chook poo is really, it's really uh, serious stuff. So I left my car one of my caravans in, in, a, in an area for, for seven days and that was enough to burn a complete perfect square in the pasture. So you can, it's, you know, it's, it's powerful stuff that we're doing here and you can get it wrong. So you've got to just adapt your, your thinking and, and learn from your mistakes. Really heavy ground impact. They've got tweezers on their faces and they'll pull grasses completely out of the ground if, they're, if they stay too long in one spot. <coughs> and yeah, collecting eggs, daily job. You know, if you want to go on holidays, you've got to find someone to do that for you, uh, which can be a bit tricky. Laying percentages fluctuate. This is one of the hardest things in terms of marketing the eggs. So you're in a natural system. You don't have the chooks in a shed where there's forced lighting and there's really seriously controlled nutrition and water. So not every chook is created equal and throughout the year, there are points in the seasons where you'll have a drop in, in laying percentage. It can fluctuate from about 85% in spring, which is when chooks, like as their birds, will, will lay eggs. Through summer, you'll get a dip, um, maybe down to 65%, possibly, or further. And then um, molting coming into autumn, or coming just out of autumn. So you've got to manage that somehow with your, with your markets. So, you know, I started out into cafes because I could see a really great opportunity there because we're in a tourist area. There are plenty of great cafes that... Um, are really interested in what we're doing and so they can add value to their product too by telling our story and their end users which is great so they're not a they're not really a middleman in the sense of that they're they're actually cooking the eggs so um, we can get a great price from them and they're on they're all on weekly kind of um, standing orders so the eggs have been sold basically before they've been laid which is fantastic but when you hit summer you get this drop in production and that you know the cafes are really rigid in what they need. They need eggs pretty much exactly the same number all year. So that's difficult. We had to diversify into some retailers that are, that understand our problems and are good customers, so that they um, can reduce their expectations when we have fluctuations. And also selling into a really disposable market like a farmers market. Chooks are susceptible to plenty of uh, pathogens and diseases. They're completely different to mammals, so you know there's a steep learning curve there, and a lot of the vets in our agricultural areas just don't know a lot about chooks. So 
we can mitigate some of these things by our, our really good practices with moving the chooks regularly away from their poo and, and spraying out trailers to um, maintain a good sanit sanitation. I've had two chooks taken to a, an avian vet to get them checked out um, just to see kind of how they were going with pathogens and things and they could not find a single worm oast in the poo. So not a single worm egg, which is, which is really a, uh, an amazing thing. The vet was like, this can't be right. <laughs> so that was really encouraging. But we have had coryza. It came in with some pullets that I bought. So at that point, I had some day-old chicks that I'd grown out to laying age. And then I, uh, had an e I got another customer. So I was like, yeah, this is great. I've got to get more eggs. How am I going to get more eggs? Well, I bought pullets in. So point of lay pullets from a, from a barn um, growing facility. They had coryza. It's a bacteria. They carry it, there's no vaccination, and they spread it through the flock really, really quickly. It's because it, it, it's, um, it's spread from chook to chook in their, um, in their droppings, but also from sneezing onto other chooks, so water droplets. There's no way to get rid of this apart from completely de deflocking the entire farm. Otherwise, in industry, it's considered really, really common. They just treat it with antibiotics, and it does respond well. If, if the, for the brave at heart here, the, the early adopters, um, it's, it is extremely easy to start one of these um, mobile poultry farms now. There's a, there's a mob called Chicken Caravan and they are basically doing everything for you. It's quite incredible. So um, their trailers are really efficient. It takes about 20 minutes to half an hour to collect around you know, the, the most eggs that we get, which is about 780 eggs per day. It's very, very quick trail, um, collecting the eggs. They're super clean because you would have seen in the video there's inclined nesting boxes in there. The eggs roll into a central conveyor belt. So they're away from the chooks. They don't get pooed on. Um, we wash probably only about 3% of the eggs. And washing is a serious labour concern. So you don't want to be handling the eggs if you can help it. Um, yeah, so their trailers have just been reduced by about 30% nearly. They're about $22,000 flat packed, so you set them up on the farm. Um, this is for 450 chooks, that's what they're rated for at night time. So when the chooks get in there, they congregate and they're about 450. You'll need around seven electric fences um, that are 50 metres and some kind of feeder. There's water is actually in, on the trailer, they come with it. But you will need some kind of feeder that is going to be able to service 450 chooks you know, at, at any given time. <coughs> so the capital investment to get you started is going to be about you know, $35,000. On my figures, and that's using an average laying percentage of 65, so a bit on the conservative side perhaps, but I think that's, you need to do that because of the fluctuations. You should be able to expect a, a return, a gross return, of about $57,000 for those 450 chooks on my prices. You'll see here that, so I've, I've worked out a net payback period. That's working on figures which are on the next slide. So you can see it's about two years. So what we can do with the chooks is we can get a net profit margin of around 30, 30%. That's taking into account purchasing the, the stock. So purchasing the chooks, the, um, the cartons, delivering the eggs, the chook food, all of your, your consumables, basically. I consider the chooks to be a consumable. So and these are the prices that we sell. We sell them actually, we don't grade our eggs. Again, when I went into it, I was like, there's no way I want to be spending my time grading eggs or buying a really expensive machine to grade the eggs for me. So we sell them per weight, in a, mostly in 150 egg boxes. So we'll weigh that box and the cafes pay accordingly on a, on a price, which is around 93 cents per 100 grams. So the average is about $80. <coughs> um, so yeah, so, so on my figures from the, the 450 chooks, you can expect to make in uh, a net profit margin, that's after paying yourself for collecting eggs, delivering eggs to, to your store, or to where you're selling them, um, of about 30% or you know, 525 dollars per hectare. That's what we've worked out on our property. In terms of the cattle, if we just stick with the conventional market place that we, we're in, that's what we can expect to kind of gross per hectare. So it's not, a, it's not extremely, you know, we're not really highly stocked or anything. Um, 
we actually lowered the stocking rate by about 10% because we, we, we thought to ourselves, well, the chooks are coming on. They are actually grazing. So they're going to they're gonna require some of the landscape um, function. They're the grass. So we reduced the, the stocking rate by about 10% and put the chooks on. But you can see the, the increase in, in uh, profit far outweighs the, the, you know, the lower stocking rate for our other industry. This is where you put two industries on top of each other. There's going to be some um, shuffling around. But this is really acceptable profit, I reckon, for a, for, a, um, for a small farm like ours. The whole property is 130 hectares, but half of that is bush. So there's only 65 hectares that we graze. Yep, and the chooks are actually only on 40 hectares. And that's a limitation of the trailer. So the trailer has to be, it can be on a slope because the inclined nest boxes actually move on an axle. It's, it's really great because they've got to be level. But there is a limitation to how steep you can actually go. So what I've done there with the prices is I've actually divided the gross income from the chooks over 65 hectares because that's the only, you know, it's the entire farm so we can compare between the cattle and the chooks. Yep. We, we raise the chicks from uh, when they're about five weeks old. So we'll keep them from day old under a brooder for about three weeks. Then they go into another hen house. So this is where they're actually stationary in the system. So there's really deep bedding to try and deal with the manure that they're putting down each day. Um, at five weeks old, we'll put them into a mobile pen like this and actually move them each day across the paddock because we want the chook manure to go onto the grass. That's where you want it. You don't want to be, you don't want it on your hands. So if I have to move, if I have to actually shovel chook poo around, I'm a really unhappy person. <laughs> you want to get the chooks to put it where it's going to be metabolized by, you, by your soil. These also, um, pens, once we've made these, you know, we need them to produce our, our, um, our hens to, our chicken, our egg hens to laying age. They're also learning out here, by the way. So they're young still, but they're learning really good skills. So they're learning how to eat grass, find insects, all those kinds of things. These pens can actually be used for other types of poultry, you know, so there's another, another layer to, this, to the stacking of the, of the infrastructure is that we could use our brooder, which provides heats to chicks. We could use those for meat, hen, meat um, poultry as well and put the meat poultry, grow them in, in, in pens like this. So there's, once you've got the eggs, you know, there really is a, an argument to go even bigger. Um, fresh, fresh, cool water is really important. Chooks can drink about seven times. I've, I've, I've recorded about seven times as much water in summer than winter. Seven times. So what they're doing there is they're panting like dogs. So they don't have um, sweat glands like us. They're panting and they're using water to evaporate inside their bodies to cool themselves down. You'll see them walking around like this. So some of the things that I seriously see as, as um, possibilities on our farm. Um, I'm not saying that I'm going to do all of these things. You know, I'm, I, I spend about 20 hours on the chooks per week. I pay myself for about 20 hours, so I do have some additional time to, to think about doing something else. Maybe the meat chickens and the turkeys. I'd be pretty keen on that. Certainly, there's a really good resource in the chicken meat that we've grown with the hens. The problem with it is that people don't really want to eat that chicken because they're so used to this really massive roasting hen that they've forgotten that you know an old boiler is actually really tasty and really delicious and good for you. But you've just got to find a way to kind of get the goodness out of them. And until the market changes its perception, I'm probably not going to be able to value add on the old hens unless I made something out of them, such as fresh chicken stock. We've already got the distribution system because we have customers that use our farm. And so adding something in like um, another product becomes easier again, especially if you're using a waste product or a perceived waste product. Dry, dehydrated chicken meat is also a really good one, I reckon. Um, aquaponics, yabbies, the, the dams are just stuffed with yabbies. We, we eat them, they're delicious. I don't know why other people, like why we shouldn't sell them to other people. Um, I'd like to get into you know, large scale composting on the farm, but, uh, but I would be looking at selling some of that to the public because I, I can't really, I can't make the argument um, really economically viable without trying to actually sell some of the product that we produce. Uh, this is really untapped, I reckon, in our farm systems. You know, this, this could be a really, a really nice earner. 
Um, but again, it might not be you. You know, it might not be the person that's managing all the all the um, the, the pasture stuff, or, the, or you're growing some vegetables, or maybe you're doing some bush tucker or something. It's a really good opportunity here to get more people into our own, our farming environments. You know, this we can put these these different industries onto our farm. They don't just have to be cattle or just sheep and cropping or whatever. You can do so much more with it. And I feel personally that we're going to have to do so much more to get to the kind of efficiencies per hectare that we need in the future to feed people. And also to give people employment. Yeah. So the chooks are um, exciting. It's an exciting thing to do. Chooks have so much personality. Um, I can see that younger farmers would really, really enjoy this, this type of farming. And the, um, you know, the income that we're getting from it is pretty decent. So even if you didn't want to do it to yourself, perhaps, you know, there may be younger farmers or uh, uh, another farmer or wannabe farmer in your community that you could lease some land to, potentially, and get those benefits that you know we're getting, but not have to actually do the work yourself.